thank you for joining the Center for Learning Health System Sciences for our monthly impact seminar. Before we get started, um, I would like to cover a few expectations. Today's seminar will be recorded. You can enable closed captioning by hitting the show captions buttons next to the raised hand option in the Zoom menu. The public slide deck will also be made available on our website under the education tab. I will post the link in the chat along with a short questionnaire asking for seminar topic and speaker suggestions. Following the presentation, we invite you to raise your hand or type questions in the Q&A. And in particular, we welcome questions exploring the many dimensions of impact that these ideas, technologies, and practices have on learning health systems. As a reminder for upcoming LHS events, our next impact seminar will take place on Tuesday, October 3rd with Dr. Stephen Dimmer, Senior Research Investigator at the Health Partners Institute. We invite you also to join us for CLHSS's first conference on September 18th and 19th, um, and registration closes on the 15th. Um, I will also put the conference link in the chat. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Genevieve Mountain-Mukes to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, well, it is my distinct honor to be able to introduce Dr. Pat Franklin. She is a professor of uh, medical social sciences, medicine and rheumatology, and orthopedic surgery at Northwestern University. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about her background first. Uh, she did a residency in preventative medicine and then a fellowship in health services research, uh, really looking at large databases and chronic conditions. And from this, this has spawned um, both a research and administration uh, program, uh, really which has bridged uh, quality improvement, informatics um, outcomes research together. Um, some of the things that I thought were uh, actually very um, interesting and, and diverse about her portfolio included uh, work uh, to um, oversee uh, the institution's data warehouse um, work where today she is a principal investigator for uh, Northwestern's K-12 uh, LHS systems uh, training program called Accelerate, or Accelerate, I'm not sure if it's a long A or not, uh, really paying it forward to train the next generation of embedded patient-centered LHS researchers. She focuses a lot on patient-centered uh, health outcomes, uh, both looking nationally as well as locally and then bridging with quality improvement. Uh, one of the things that I thought was quite interesting and has been um, really um, given a lot of accolades is her work around the force uh, uh, total joint replacement or TJR uh, work, which is a comparative effectiveness research around uh, total joint replacement, and that is a program uh, grant. And this was even um, really uh, recognized by the National Academy of Medicine. So with that, I'm um, really excited to have you uh, join us today, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Franklin. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, be with you today, so I'm just going to take a minute and share my screen, and we'll get started. Trust everyone can see that. Okay, so I'm Pat Franklin. I am at Northwestern now um, in the Department of Medical Social Sciences primarily um, because in collaborating with the rheumatologists and orthopedists, and you're going to hear about my work today that I think is part of the learning health system. So I, um, I welcome questions both about the content of this work and it's a uh, is an example of learning health systems research. Um, just as a point of disclosure, my, and, and it gives you a sense of the kind of work that I do, that it ranges from comparative effectiveness research and outcomes, but the uh, social determinants work and learning health systems, but with a particular focus on patient-generated data being integrated into all of the work that I do. Um, also, I'm going to present today, but it takes a team, a very broad team in, the, in this situation, um, biostatisticians, research assistants, psychometricians, um, analysts, and content knowledge experts, and particularly our network of surgeons and our patient advisors that you'll hear more about today. And this work is primarily funded by PCORI, but based on work that um, the P50 that uh, you heard mentioned in the introduction. 
So first, because many people aren't aware of this, I want to just start with one slide on side of the background of why OA. Um, knee and hip osteoarthritis, or OA, is the most common and costly cause of disability in the United States today. And over 60% of adults more over this age of 65 years will tell you that they have some arthritis. So the common cause of arthritis, there are rare um, causes of arthritis, but is osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear disease of the, in this case, knee and hip joints. Because there is no cure for the progression of osteoarthritis, more than 1.2 million knee and hip arthroplasty surgeries are performed annually. And with the aging US population, they projected that the volume of surgeries will increase by over 200% by 2030. So this is a public health concern, both the, um, the lack of a cure for arthritis, the progression of the pain and disability that's associated with it, and the costs associated with the end-stage treatment through surgery. Um, we'll focus, I'll use knee or, um, replacement and knee arthritis as my example today, but these principles all apply to the hip as well. But two out of every three surgeries are for knee arthritis. Um, the average total knee replacement patient, just to give you a profile of who these patients are, are um, on average 65 years of age. They are on average obese with the mean BMI of 32. They, they're, uh, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, tension, and depression is the same that you would see in primary care, so 20% or so. Um, and 50% or more of these patients have two or more comorbid conditions. So these in general are aging adults and typical of the patients you would see in primary care. Now, patient, what I've done over 15 years of research in arthritis is, is not, it's because physical function is, a, is an interest of mine, but primarily it's a real, it's a perfect use case for patient reported outcome measures because there is no single biomarker that assesses the progression in the pain and functional limitations associated with OA. So over the last decade, the work that I've been doing is using patient-reported outcome measures to assess the trajectory and the progress of pain and functional limitations. And because we still don't have, you know, all the inflammatory biomarkers are not specific to arthritis and they're not specific to the joints of knee or hip, we use x-rays and we use the x-ray to say, ah, there are the changes we expect with um, osteoarthritis, you know, a joint space narrowing, sclerotic changes of the bone. But what the x-ray does not tell us is whether the pain is progressing or the functional limitations are progressing. So it diagnoses a way, but without a measure of progression, which tr traditional biomarkers do. So it's a perfect use case for patient reported outcome measures. Um, that's my work at Northwestern in the last five years, um, because PROMIS is housed here at, in the Department of Medical and Social Sciences. But I have been using PROMS for over a decade in the work that I do, and particularly measures of symptoms, pain in particular, functional status or activities of daily living, and general quality of life. So um, you will hear these as foundational metrics in the work that I'm doing. And I wanted to point out that Medicare has now mandated that by 2027, all surgeons performing joint replacement of the knee and hip will be mandated to collect PROs preoperatively and at 12 months postoperatively. So those timeframes are anchored and present in all the data I'll show you today. In fact, some of the work we've done has helped inform those standards. So I was the PI um, for a decade of this FORCE TJR, the Function and Outcomes Research is what FORCE stands for, um, for competitive effectiveness in joint replacement. And it was a national cohort of 200 surgeons um, who enrolled 28,000 patients from 28 states. We used a random um, stratified random sample of US surgeons to make sure that our, the sample included community-based surgery, specialists, general high and low volume orthopedists. And we generated national norms for patient reported outcome measures before and at one year after surgery that are useful today. 
Secondly, it includes patients of all ages with a longitudinal data set, because today the average age is 65, so half of patients who undergo total joint replacement, about half, 45%, are under 65. So we don't have any single data set in the US to capture those patients, where if you were in the UK or Australia, there's nice national data, none of that exists in the US. So this information has become important for understanding the use of this procedure and its outcomes. The strength of the registry data that I will, I'm just in one slide about this, is not that I think you have to have registries, but in the US, where we do not have longitudinal data on all ages, um, the best we have is the Medicare population. Um, and with the advent of uh, the private Medicare uh, products, we still, we, you know, that's further limiting our access to national data. So these data, while they're aging, are important because they complete have complete longitudinal data. And that was defined a decade ago as including PROs. So I've been collecting PROs for a long time. It has complete clinical data because we ask patients to supplement what we could learn from the claims and their clinical records. For example, we have full height and weight so we can collect BMI. We have past medical events that didn't happen at the institution of the index surgery. We have their behaviors like smoking. We have social factors that we collected a decade ago on race, education, income, ethnicity, living situation. And these were all patient reported. In addition to PROs, which captured the pain severity and function using standardized metrics. Um, of note, this data set to, to participate, we audited oper um, OR logs, so the surgical logs. So we know more than 90% of patients who completed the data set when we enrolled them and we followed them um, for five years, but today we'll focus on the one year outcome data. And we do know that we had 80% um, follow up with those patients. So we do have readmission data and the traditional clinical adverse event outcomes in this data set. But what we'll focus on today are the PROs. So when we did this work, which as a population scientist, it was very important to me. But in the past, I've run quality programs. And I was really bothered that this quality data was helping us compare across settings and generate norms. But we were not returning data to patients or clinicians in a format that could support um, decisions. So in our learning health system, um, we were returning quality data um, as a learning health system to each of the participating sites. But we did this, this current grant that I'll show you is funded by PCORI in the improving health systems category, but the effort was to return data to patients. So based on a systems change model, the chronic care model or collaborative care model, we want to transform this data that represent clinical and patient reported information to a decision support system that would provide real-time reports. And we call it the ASK report or arthritis through shared knowledge. And the goal was to return these data in an equal way to, in, to um, support informed and activated patients and proactive and prepared practice teams so that the patient's voice in their data were available at the decision for surgery or non-surgical care um, in these patients. So the first step um, in one of this work funded by PCORI was actually co-designed with patients and clinicians to generate the format and the content of the report itself. So we used patients in central Massachusetts and the Bronx, New York, who were seeking orthopedic evaluation for their knee and hip arthritis. And we use these because these were um, safety net hospitals and wanted more diversity in the patient participation. Surgeons from these centers and two others, um, as well as nurse practitioners were involved in the clinical perspective of the co-design. In an iterative um, key informant interviews and group interviews, we um, assess the patient reported outcome measures, their clarity, their use, clinical risk factors, and we wanted to include predicted or estimated um, improvement in pain in physical function if patients were to choose surgery. Um, we also wanted to provide information on non-surgical treatment options. We wanted to understand how patients best understood the visualization 
of these data since numeracy is a concern. And I put this note to myself to tell you that we learned from patients exactly how they wanted the data, both the PRO score and its improvement, as well as information about what symptoms may persist. For example, if my PRO or my aggregate pain score was likely to improve after surgery, because these are generally very effective surgeries, will I have persistent pain at rest? Because that's a very distressed dis um, distressing symptom? And the answer is almost never. But will I have pain walking five blocks? That's a question on these PROs. We could tell them that, that there were, that there were a subgroup of patients who had persistent lingering symptoms in physical activity. So that's the kind of dialogue we had. So to give you an example, these are the kind of feedback we got. One person said, I like this template for the report, it would be helpful. I'm somewhat fearful of having surgery and I'd like to postpone as long as possible. On the other side, we had someone saying, I'm concerned that people wait too long to have surgery. This would help you know if it's time, it's time because you're comparing my symptoms to this national data set. A third symptoms person said, well, I, a patient gets used to not being able to bend my knee or tie my own shoes. The questions on the PRO reminded me by the time I got into the surgeon's exam room, there it is. What do you mean my score is only a 40 or low function? My primary care doctor thought I was too young for surgery. So this is the kind of questions and the nature of the people we were um, dealing with as they helped us figure out the, the um, optimal design for this test of the report. So we, we landed on a, a, a solution that is our first best guess. Um, you'll, we'll talk today that it's not perfect, but it has a lot of attributes that are well received by patients. That the first page was very simple descriptive data. This is the pain you told us about today. This is the function level you told us today in your right and left hip and your right and left knee. Um, and this is how that compares to the national data that I um, described to you. Um, then what are the risk factors that your surgeon will be concerned about? For example, do you smoke? Are you overweight or obese? And what comorbidities might exist? Then on page two, to separate it, we've taken your data, that profile on page one, and estimated your likely pain and function. So you could see change, if any, over time. And we will tell you whether you have persistent pain when you're sitting, walking, or climbing stairs, because those are the three activities that you prioritize. Page three will use the traditional decision grid with um, out information about physical therapy, injections, and medications that you might choose as a non-operative alternative to your surgery. So we call this the ASK report, um, and this is just to give you a picture, very visual, very simple. We did not want it to be constrained by the HR. We programmed it through other software in order to be able to give trajectories and knees and hips and global measures, risk factors, and outcomes. So let me just show you a little bit more detail. So on page one, when I say descriptive patient pain and function, or clinical data, this is what we would have, is that for your right knee, and we'd repeat this, the left knee and left hip and right hip, um, green means healthier scores, red means worse. It was based on that fourth data that I described to you. Um, it wasn't there to tell you a right or wrong choice for care, but what it is telling you is your score and how they compare to the severity of scores in our national data set. Um, in the bottom, you they will see these are key risk factors that surgeons consider when um, in anesthesiologists, for that matter, in scheduling surgery, and things that some are modifiable and some are not. Um, if once we link to the clinical database, we might prefer to have hemoglobin A1C. Here we knew that they were had um, medication treated type two diabetes. Um, whether they were a smoker, their BMI, emotional health from the proms, narcotic use, um, persistence of low back pain and pain in other joints, and medical comorbidities, which was a modified Charlson index, and age, because these are significant predictors of outcomes at a year, and we knew that from the national data as well as um, there's good literature in the surgeon's um, literature about the risks of these pose in the period period. Page two, which was the no more novel part, was describing your pain today, your knee pain in this case, or your knee function, 
and scores and the estimated improvement at one year after surgery in people like you with those risk factors um, so that you got a sense of change. And here, it's not the precise number because we're, we know there's a range around that number, but more that you're moving from this low color range to the positive, more positive or healthy range. And um, the global physical function, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but global pros just say overall, how healthy might you be? And you can see improvement, but oops, sorry, but not as dramatic as the pain relief, for example, and functional gain in the knee, because this might be an obese patient or a patient with low back pain that will have some health limitations, but their knee should be feeling better. Um, then this required, once we knew the optimal design of the individual, that we develop an IT or an information data flow to serve that because we were testing this report in a 12th center multi-site study. So we used a web-based system that would, um, the ask survey system, and it was red cap based. We'd push out a survey request asking the patient for their standardized PROs plus key risk factors. The survey was returned to the system where it could update the registry data that we had for predictive analytics, as well as generate that color-coded report um, that patients helped us co-design. Clinicians endorsed the content, but we had the patients drive the format so that we knew that we could, um, to the best of our ability, present it in a way that would be understandable. At midnight the night before the patient's visit, a batch email went to the front end staff saying, these seven people are scheduled with Dr. So-and-so tomorrow. Um, attached is the report. You can upload it to the EHR system and we issued colored printers because we want the patients to go home with a copy of this report. So it's their data um, so that it could be used in the clinic. We then um, went through a lot extensive clinical microsystem based training where the staff, the front end staff and the leadership and the patients were all trained about what is this. So I, I'm just emphasizing in this flow that once we had that piece of data in our system, the office staff received that email with the reports to print out and to uh, make available in the EHR. Um, we can talk about in the future, um, depending upon its effectiveness, we would like this to be an API. Um, the real-time scored reports are then available for review in the decision room for the patient to take notes and for that availability. As this would you would expect, during COVID, um, we had a significant disruption to some of the office flow. While it didn't affect enrollment or data collection or report generation, we could not depend upon the office staff to make the debt report available. So the by then, we were 3,000 patients into the study, and surgeons were very willing to let us um, mail and email reports in advance to the patients so they had it available to them. But we'll talk about how this is, um, the, the, other, the other issues of office flow, like virtual visits, et cetera, influence use of the decision report. So the study itself. Um, this is a cluster randomized trial of 18 surgeons per arm, 36 total, who happen to be practicing in 12 sites. Um, and one I already showed you in detail was refining that report. We knew what the, multi the multivariate predictive model should look like, but we needed to define a report that patients and surgeons could use well. Um, then we randomized the sites, the 18 surgeons, <clears throat> to be either in the ASK report site or usual care. All of these sites had PROs available in their EHR. We collected the data for both arms, but the reporting was just as usual in the control sites and was the report in the intervention sites. Then in phase two or in three, um, the sites moved forward. So we the ASK report sites got an additional virtual coach, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but we're because we're analyzing that data now. And the control sites adopted the ASK report so that we could have some pre-post comparisons as well as cross-site comparisons. And as fate would have it, we had enrolled about 2,990 of, so three, uh, we were almost at 3,000 in March of 2020. So AIM-2 was just about to close with 3,000 patients um, when things closed down for COVID. And the second, so AIM-2 is actually pre-COVID and AIM-3 is post-COVID. 
believe it enough, which is um, good because we it helps us with contextual interpretation of these data. Overall, we enrolled 5713 um, patients, so just 95% of our total goal of 6,000, um, even during COVID, with half during COVID. And then we followed these patients at one, six, and 12 months to collect their patient reported data to understand their treatment choices, their evolution, and their pain and function. For those of you who are doing familiar with implementation science, this is a proctor model for just, and I'm going to not use the implementation science model as much today, but I wanted to say that we really understood that this implementation was multi-level. That there is a report and the IT produces it, the patients generate it from the data for this. But in order to test this, we actually worked with the um, IT leadership in each of these sites to get sign off for this um, privacy and use of this parallel um, web based system. We worked with the heads of quality to help them understand that we produce aggregate data that they could use and they knew this 2027 mandate was coming, so it was valuable to them. We worked with the surgeons to make sure they understood what you know the report, if they were not part of the co-design, and its use with patients. We worked with patients to engage them in the pros. And so we had a plan from the beginning to assess feasibility, fidelity, penetration, acceptability. And the primary endpoints for the PCORI study were the decision quality, um, their improvement in pain and function and symptoms. So let's start with feasibility because that was um, an important uh, platform that we needed to, you know, or, or threshold that we needed to exceed. The interesting part was while PROs are challenging to use or deploy from a portal in the EHR, we, that reason is because of the barrier of the portal. And secondarily, the patients don't understand it's part of their clinical assessment and the use for their surgery. So we had standard letters that went out from the surgeons, um, both by email and print, to tell patients that these data would be used and reviewed at the first visit and were part of the assessment. And the good news is with email only from the system, 36% um, of patients or 33% pre-COVID, 41% post-COVID, when we were very technology dependent, um, reported this, uh, the PROs and the, the additional risk factor data without prompts. It, with that letter that told them this data, mat these data matter, these will be reviewed at your, your visit. Um, we, for the next, we doubled the return rate by um, calling or texting patients. So leaving a voicemail, texting them, and linking it to, again, to their surgeon. So they understood this matters. The population were patients coming for the first visit to this orthopedist's office to discuss surgery versus non-surgical care. Therefore, they had no experience with, oops, I'm sorry, um, with the pros before. Um, so we wanted to introduce it to them. The good news is 76% of our of the 6,000 patients, of 5,700 patients, completed the data before they arrived in the office. And before um, the, about a third were doing the survey um, electronically in the office before COVID, and we collected additional data after COVID, but it had reduced to about 23%. We then did extend, um, after completing phase one or the first 3,000 patients, we um, completed qualitative interviews with sample surgeons and patients. And these data are published, the, the results of the next two slides. And we learned from the surgeon that they were very supportive and very clear um, about their communication goals with the report. They saw it as educational, that edu patients learned about um, reporting their symptoms what was severe or not, what risk factors mattered to this decision. They thought that page two supported expectation setting, that while on average patients experienced great pain relief and improved physical function, that their comorbidities and other factors will compromise. It's not a perfect outcome. They did think that it's the report supported shared decision-making or collaborative review of the data. And they also thought that it affirmed treatment recommendations. So it was, this is my best clinical guess, but now I had this information to support that. When we asked patients, what did you think? And we have two papers now published on the patient assessment. I list one of them here. They said 
they're pretty parallel. You know, this provided information about my health. It taught me something new or confirmed the symptoms I knew were bad. Um, it provided a frame of reference compared to other patients who have knee and hip arthritis. And it could help me assess better my health status. It did foster setting expectations and asking and answering questions with my surgeon. And it actually, we're pleased to see that they said that it helped me build my confidence regarding treat, the treatment decision I made, whether it was surgical or non-surgical. Um, because as I, I don't think I have a slide here to show you, but at that first visit, 40% of patients chose surgery and 60% chose non-operative care for now. It's a process over time. And additional patients chose surgery at six and 12 months. So our primary endpoint of this research was that will this report help with decisional conflict, reducing decisional conflict, the scale is a measure of decisional conflict, or it's flip, improve decision quality if you have the absence of decisional conflict. So decisional conflict is a construct that um, is known to increase with the complexity of the decision. So when there are multiple options and with arthritis, there's no clear instruction, today's the day you need that surgery. It's not like the occlusion of your cardiac vessels where you know, you're at risk of a heart attack or death, you need to have surgery. Is that this is actually, are these symptoms bothering you? To what extent and to what extent do they limit your function? So. There's, it's a setup for complex and, and, and decisional um, complexity. Also, there were modifiable factors. We can provide more information. We can say, do, what do other patients like you decide? Um, what is the impact on the outcome that you have diabetes or other, you're obese or have other comorbid conditions? And so there, we know there's greater decisional conflict when you're uninformed about alternatives and risks and benefits unclear about your, how this impacts you, they use the word values here, and if the decision is unsupported. So we were optimistic and hopeful that this report may make a difference in decision, reducing decisional conflict. We used a stand, I should tell you, we used a standardized tool, um, the decisional conflict scale that includes 16 items, and it was administered by the research assistant as they, after the first, first visit to the surgeon, after they had made an initial um, dis treatment decision, and before they consented to longitudinal follow-up over time. So that's important to know that, that um, this was not administered by the office staff, it was administered by the research assistant, and it was when we were recruiting patients for that longitudinal follow-up. This is the distribution of the decision conflict score by treatment decision at the first visit. So those who chose surgery today, total joint replacement today is in the top graph, and those who chose non-operative care were in the bottom graph. And the first thing you'll see is the, the left red line is 25 or lower. That's the optimal, the absence of decisional conflict, the, the tool developers tell us a good decision, a confident decision, is a score of less than 25. Fortunately, we found that um, on average, people who chose total joint replacement surgery on average had a score at that 25 threshold. Um, but there were those patients that had a higher score. Um, but the non-operative patients still had that persistent decisional conflict about what's the right thing for me. Today, I chose non-operative care. That may change over time. And particularly 10% of those patients had a score above 37, which is a threshold in this scale for anxiety or, you know, um, a great deal of decisional conflict. And that was not true for those who chose in surgery. We then looked at the consistency with when the, with the surgeon used the report, because in that interview that the research staff conducted that asked those 16 items about decisional conflict, they said, did you receive a copy of the report to take home? And did you review the report with your surgeon? So there could have been some recall, under recall or recall bias, but people were very clear with us. And what we learned was there, while on average, um, before COVID, 70% of patients told us that they reviewed the report with their doctor. Um, that was not true after COVID, for reasons we can talk about. 
So what we did was look across the 5,700 patients and had the individual report of, did I use the report with my surgeon? And we found in the offices where less than 50% of the, the patients were receiving the report and using the report, the mean decisional conflict score was higher, meaning more decisional conflict, than the offices where they were using the report consistently. So the example is 27 and a half versus 25. And you could say, well, is two points uh, meaningful? And the developers of the tool say that for every one point lower, you are five times more confident that you will not change your decision in the decision, less conflict. And you can see within hip patients and knee replacement patients, the trend was towards a lower score, meaning more decisional, less decisional conflict or just higher quality. But the um, it was really seemed to be important to the patients that were choosing non-operative care. Then we built a multivariate model of predicting decisional conflict. And we put patient factors, the use of the report, and the surgeon factors into the model. And I'm pausing here with this is not the complete model, but I wanted you to see that while on average in our qualitative research, we found that patients were highly accepting of the report, that it was important to note that people self-reporting a black race or Hispanic Lat or Latino um, ethnicity were two points on average, two points lower um, scores in decisional conflict, meaning more decisional conflict. People with less than a high school education, same thing, about two points lower. High literacy was independently associated with a lower, I, I'm sorry, let me be really clear because I get confused with these words. A higher score, these positive numbers, means more decisional conflict. A lower score means less conflict and a better confidence in your decision. So the lower score with the high literacy is in, is in the direction we'd like to see. And you can see that it really wasn't the clinical comorbidities that were driving confidence. It was, but it what there is something embedded in the whether it is um, trust, communication, or the report that did not uniformly um, benefit all patients. And then in the final multivariate model, after adjusting for the treatment choice, joint replacement or not, patient attributes and office report use, we found that the report use was independently associated with a lower decisional conflict. And this was true for both surgical and non-surgical patients on average, but a stronger effect in the subgroup that were non-operative treatment patients. So, so far what we've learned is that about three quarters of patients can self-report PROs and their risk factors and generate this prediction model and report before the, arriving at the office, even during COVID. So we um, have a support program where you can um, do the survey while you're waiting on an iPad or your phone. Um, varied environments, the 12 sites or the 36 surgeons were able to integrate the report successfully. There were no complaints from the staff about slowing the patient down. There was the extra staff of generating the report. What you should know is during COVID, staff were no longer printing in the reports in the office and were inconsistently making the report available to the surgeon. So um, we can cleanly analyze the first 3,000 patients. We can analyze the second 2,700 because we know which of those individuals saw the report and in which offices. But it is um, not as consistent as it was before COVID, obviously. Um, we also learned that in interviews with patients and clinicians that they had very specific reasons they liked receiving these data, transferring these system data, which were inpatient-generated data, into reports that are useful in the decision. And the use of the ASK report was associated with less decision conflict or a stronger quality decision among patients who chose surgery. So they came thinking, is this right for me? And they felt more affirmed. Um, versus non-operative care, uh, although those patients had st fairly strong decisional um, quality. The in offices where consistently the report was used, and with those with a higher literacy, meaning a college education or greater, but not as but the association um, was offset by those patients who reported minority race or ethnicity or less than higher um, a high school education. So it means we have more work to do 
in both the conveying of the report and the communication with this patient population. Um, overall, I do think that patient-centered and individualized information, if we have it, is important to return to patients. The data collection, processing, and integration is not easily done in EHRs today, but we have plenty of software that can transform real-world data into multivariate prediction models, simple reports, color-coded, um, meet the preferences of patients. And with the use of APIs, which we're hoping is our next step to revise the report and, and have it integrated with EHRs, it would make it more readily available to clinicians and patients. My second point is that longitudinal data, whether it's from EHRs or registries or claims, plus patient data with their symptoms, have the potential to generate more precise evidence. And I think we need to be really cautious within institutions where EHRs are not collecting the longitudinal experience of the patient, especially in specialty offices like orthopedics. Um, that is a concern. And last, incomplete data in overburdened office staff, whether it was COVID or not, will limit the implementation of these analytics and the use of the data in practice. So I, this is not insurmountable. We were able to train the office staff to use it, but in the height of the pandemic for about 12 months, it was obviously um, not readily available. So that's my last slide. I wanted to close and leave time for discussion and um, questions from the, the attendees. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. That was incredibly informative. Um, to everyone, we have about 10 minutes for discussion, so feel free to raise your hand or put questions in the chat. Yes, Genevieve. This is Genevieve. Maybe I'll start us off. I'm, I'm curious about um, care team engagement. Uh, whether uh, from nursing, uh, the extended care team, the providers and surgeons and, and kind of perceptions around that? Yeah, great question. So we absolutely, um, in, in the design of the report itself, we focused on clinicians and patients. But in that slide on clinical microsystems, we actually chose the clinic leader the front end staff who receive frequently asked questions and orientation to the report because they were our ally in making sure that when they saw patients coming in, they thought knew the value of, of making that report available to patients and the, clinic, the surgeon or nurse practitioner. As well as for those who didn't complete it, it was going to fall to them to say, would you be willing to do it today? So they were really important allies. Three of the 12 sites are early adopters of PROs and had a staff member, a, a clerk, not a clinical researcher, not a clinician, a clerk who was responsible for this. And, you know, in those sites, since I was at one of those sites before I came to Northwestern, um, I know that the argument we made for the hospital administration was you would never draw blood without a phlebotomist or send someone to for x-rays without an x-ray tech. And we just need a clerk to um, help patients assist, assist this. Now, it is seen as an incremental cost. In the other sites, they didn't have that kind of a staff person. So the responses we got were driven by that front-end staff who, up to, you know, who today um, update your insurance status, but don't necessarily engage in collecting this kind of clinical and patient data. So, but with education, they were our allies. I mean, that's why on average 20, 20 to 23 percent were collected as patients waited. Patients at the bottom line, they knew this was coming. So by the time they got to the office, they had heard from us through email and gotten a text message and a, and a phone call that just said, hey, we know you're seeing Dr. So-and-so, you know, on this day. And we made, the st our study staff made that call. But that script was handed to all the offices saying, you know, if you were to continue this, this is the kind of call we made and why we did it this way, because people are responsive if they are, you know, taking this big step to be become evaluated by a specialist, um, we find them very highly responsible and, and you know, will three quarters could complete this before they coming to the office and then your staff can help them with the rest. It's really important to consider the office flow, but we didn't want the burden to be on the office. We really wanted to maximize the collection before getting there so that that list is shorter for who are the new patients today. 
who may need this information because they're already burdened. And then obviously with the acute pandemic months, I have a trend where we, you know, can show you the months where people said, nope, didn't get it, didn't receive it. You know, it was in a trough during those six months of the early pandemic. Um, then when um, virtual visits and others re resumed, then we could see the, the use increase again because we were actually doing every other week phone calls to front end staff and checking on them, making sure they're okay and, and uh, keep you know supporting them the best that we could. But it is a team effort. And I think it's not just IT. What's the flip of that? It's not just IT. IT is necessary, but not sufficient in our experience. Um, patients and your staff are critical support for this and the clinician's willingness to use the data. Because if you think it's not worthwhile, it was never discussed, that certainly could be a discouraging factor in future reporting. We have a question about, first of all, they say a great presentation. They're also wondering, was the survey sent out in only English or other languages? Um, they noted that there were community clinic sites and could you comment on the diversity in that data? Sure. So um, there's two levels of comment I want to make in that to response to that question. First of all, is the disparity that I can't control and I'm not happy about that answer, but there is a gross disparity in from at the point of referral to specialists from primary care. So there are already are a minority of patients who are, are um, of non-Caucasian race and non um, English speaking or English language. So about 9% of our population, which is actually representative of the national experience of, of elective joint replacement offices, um, are reported black or Hispanic race or a non-primary English speaking preference. We had all the information available in English and Spanish, as well as a bilingual recruiter who could speak with patients who were Spanish speakers. Um, however, so, so the first thing is the pool was small because of that non-referral. Um, so our actually our next work is into primary care in the federally qualified health centers in Chicago to work on referral. But the of those who were referred, which was the study population, we did a representative patients. We did not have information available in other languages, although pros are tr translated. We didn't have the bandwidth of the staff to support and facilitate data collection in the other languages. And finally, I would say that unfortunately, PROs in many Epic app installations are only in English today, despite the translations being available. So that is a bigger concern um, in general. So it's a great question. Um, and Rubina, so um, she's, Rubina is wondering what measures were taken to make sure that members of the patient's team didn't leave the study? Um, since you didn't want any direct disruptions in the research team? Oh, great question. Great question. Um, so we, yeah, we, I'm happy to talk to you about that. We had a, um, one of my colleagues who I've been working on with since force, which was that national data, we learned early on that research assistants who work Monday through Friday are not the ideal people we wanted to support patients. So we hire part-time um, women and men evenings and Saturday mornings to make phone calls and text messages directly to patients. And we assign patients to those people. So there's a longitudinal relationship that we hope would emerge um, between patients and the return, you know, the response at, at six and 12 months. So having about 84% response at six months and 12 months and 90% did one or the other is high in this um, community. So we, we do believe that that process worked. They all were trained in motivational interviewing. Um, they spoke, you know, only one was bilingual. The others were English language speakers primarily. But we, um, that was based on the proportion of patients that we knew to expect in the orthopedic offices um, having diverse language needs. So during COVID, because they were already virtual and calling these patients nationally and nights and weekends, we actually had great stability in our staff. That's not the same as staffing a clinic, right? We're showing up face to face, the, the, the time and, and pressures of infectious diseases are very pre prevalent. So that was good fortune that that's the model that had worked with us for us for all those 
patient-centric reasons for over the decades um, that we found we reach people better in the evenings and weekends and have a, a flexible workforce, um, which I should have explained to you that wasn't, they were all trained in city, you know, they were city certified, they were research trained, but they, they were not just um, survey, you know, anonymous survey researchers, they were trained in clinical research, but they had a non-traditional um, role or, or study um, the outline of their job description. Um, Don is wondering about your own expectations for effective prom use in TJR as these procedures mitigate mi migrate further into ambulatory surgery centers. Are you considering more advanced analytic methods such as Bayesian or machine learning estimization? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we completely hear what you're saying is that the technology, first of all, there were a lot of practice changes during COVID moving to ambulatory surgery centers. So our, our older data cohort is no longer applicable. It was a radical shift to its ambulatory care for providing the surgery. It was also a decline in the use of post-operative physical therapy and supports for functional gain. We are, that's the kind of work we're doing right now with this data is because we had this sample before and after that we know, you know, we can look at did um, functional gains change during, you know, that perioperative period um, after those practice changes. We would like larger data sets in order to use more creative AI and machine learning methods for and, and sophisticated statistics for predicting this. But we were when we proposed this six years ago, um, the world has really accelerated since then. This was seen as you know novel and taking this large data and getting it in the hands of patients in a way that they may understand. And we agree with you. The methods have accelerated in both the data processing data collection and, and actually the clinical practice changed dramatically in the last couple of years. So that needs to be evaluated. So absolutely, all good questions. And also the referral base needs to expand because we know this disparity among primary care offices not referring some entities um, from their offices. So for all those reasons, this is not a finished product. And I think I, I'm really interested because that is what the challenge is for single site um, clinical decision support with all those moving parts. And so we do see some benefits to this aggregate data in that we'd be able to keep a fresh and evolving national normative database that we hoped could support an API um, that in, in these future iterations. I'd welcome your thoughts on that, but that's <laughs> great. All right, well, we have, I'm going, we have time for one more quick question and then we will wrap it up. Um, Dylan says, excellent. Presentation, they want to know, is there any use of alerts and reminders in the ask report generated? Alerts or reminders to complete the data or to use it? I actually both ways. Great point. Yes. I mean, you know, we had a series of patient reminders to complete the data. The staff got that midnight report saying here are the seven people that are coming in tomorrow, four have the data, three don't. You'll need to collect these three. And the surgeon got a reminder that the report was available. So, and the patients we in our ideal world walked in with a copy that we mailed to them or emailed to them. Um, so it was actually a multi-pronged sense of hopefully bringing this to, data to bear in the decision making. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Dr. Franklin. That was welcome. wonderful. Um, and in closing, please join everyone else, please join us for our next seminar on October 3rd with Dr. Deemer. Stephen Deemer, and we hope to see you at our conference in a couple of weeks. And this concludes our presentation. See you next time. <laughs>